title of our upcoming experiment is Investigating the Reactivity of Cobalt-2 and Chloride in Aqueous Solution. There's not a ton in this experiment that's actually new. It's really an opportunity to build on and showcase the skills, concepts, and ideas that you've developed in Chemical Principles 2 Laboratory to date in a situation that's a little bit more open-ended and based on a primary literature article. So we're going to attempt to replicate the work in a Journal of Chemical Education paper previously published and compare our results to the results they obtained and explore the different ways that they analyzed this data. So this experiment is especially going to draw from the measurement of an equilibrium constant and solubility in equilibria and temperature experiments, and I hope you'll see resonance with those experiments as you work through completing the experiment itself and then working up the data. Before we get into discussing the experiment itself, I wanted to talk through the paper, particularly pointing out places to look for important information and what you can generally expect from this thing. So it's laid out like a classic scientific paper, the structure of which we're pretty familiar with at this point, with an abstract on the main front page. If you're not viewing the article on campus or on the VPN, you probably won't see this read online button, but in this general area, you'll be able to access the article using your Georgia Tech credentials. You can also turn on the VPN to get this view and access the article this way. We can either read it online on an HTML web page or via the PDF. I'll go ahead and pull up the PDF just to show you what this looks like. The abstract is at the top. I would look at this first, read through the abstract, understand the general gist of what's going on. Here's a graphical abstract. Here it's simply the absorbance spectra of the reactant and product. And then in reading through the paper, generally I would focus actually on the figures first. See if you can understand what's going on in the figures first and use the text surrounding the figures to get a sense of, of the article itself. This will give you a general overview of really the conceptual background of what they did, what the results were, and what the implications are. To actually reproduce the work, we need more detailed information about what they actually did. That typically does not show up in these documents. That's typically listed in what's called supporting information, and supporting information is usually included at the end of the paper. To access it for this article, once you have permissions to view the article, you'll see supporting information in the HTML version uh, of the article right at the top here. So supporting info right here, there are two documents and it will kick you down to the links which you can see on the right hand side right here. So if we click supporting information, this includes in this particular article resources for instructors, resources for students, sample data, and a procedure, and that's really the key. The procedure starts here on page six and is going to really be our basis for how we approach tackling this experiment, trying to reproduce the work of these authors as closely as we can and compare our results to theirs. So I won't go into detail on what the procedure is at this point. We'll get to that later in the video. I just wanted to alert you mainly to where to find things within this article. The article itself doesn't tell you everything. A lot of the nitty gritty science actually happens in the supporting information. That's a general point about scientific papers. The paper itself often gives you a general overview, but if you really want to get into the weeds and verify the claims made in a paper, you've got to dig into the supporting information. All right, so now let's get into the details of the experiment itself. And keep in mind, this is all based on a Journal of Chemical Education article. Here is an ACS style citation for that article. You can Google this or type this into a reference resolver to go quickly to the article. And I'll actually paste a link in the description for this video to a fantastic chemistry reference resolver that you can type citations like this into that will kick you directly to the article without the intermediate step of rooting through Google. Super useful resource if you're going to be doing research in chemistry. So to begin with this experiment, we really need to take a step back and look at the relationship between equilibrium and free energy. And we've seen this previously in the solubility and temperature experiment. So the standard free energy change, delta G naught, is related to the equilibrium constant of a reaction K. And this is true of any chemical reaction. We can rearrange this equation and incorporate the enthalpy and entropy change to obtain this equation, which relates the natural log of the equilibrium constant to the inverse of the temperature in Kelvin and also incorporates that enthalpy change and entropy change. What this equation allows us to do is make measurements of the reaction temperature and the corresponding equilibrium constant 
relate those on a graph by plotting the natural log of the equilibrium constant as a function of one over the temperature, where again the temperature is in Kelvin, and this should theoretically give a linear relationship based on this equation. To see that, let's consider the y-intercept and the slope. The y-intercept on this graph corresponds to delta s, standard delta s, divided by r. And so, for example, on this hypothetical plot, and your results could give a positive or negative intercept, but on this hypothetical, the y-intercept is positive, the entropy change is thus positive, based on the fact that the y-intercept is positive. The slope corresponds to negative delta h standard divided by r. So here, we've got a negative slope. The slope is less than zero. This indicates that the enthalpy change is positive, thanks to the negative sign right here. So the results indicated right here suggest both delta H and delta S positive. You may see that in the lab, you may not. Actually, if you read the paper, you'll get a sense of what these authors obtained, and it's a good idea to have a sense of that before you come into the lab to do the experiment. The bottom line here is that the dependence of the equilibrium constant on temperature tells us what the values of delta H standard and delta S standard are, and we saw this idea previously in the solubility equilibria and temperature lab. Now let's dig into the specific system of interest here. We're going to be interested, as suggested by the title of the experiment, on a system consisting of the cobalt-2 ion, cobalt-2+, plus and chloride. And the specific reaction of interest is the reaction of the hexa-aqua cobalt-2 cation, which is this guy right here, with chloride anions, all in aqueous solution, to produce a cobalt chloride complex, specifically tetrachlorocobaltate-2 and six waters. So cobalt's oxidation state has not changed. All that occurs in this reaction is the displacement of the six water ligands by four chlorides to produce COCl4. 2 minus. This is a reversible reaction, as we will see, to dramatic effect in this experiment, and so it has a K value that is relatively close to 1, we might say, and more importantly, that K varies profoundly with temperature. To measure that K, we're going to measure the equilibrium concentrations of the products and the reactants. And so let's write the form of the equilibrium expression really quickly here. COCl42- is the only aqueous product. Its stoichiometric coefficient is 1, and so it just appears in the numerator. And in the denominator, we have a factor for the molarity of the hexaqua cobalt 2 cation, as well as a molarity of chloride raised to the fourth power because of its coefficient of four. So all very familiar ideas from the theory of chemical equilibrium, nothing too complicated here. Now, what's this actual reaction going to look like? Well, after we've prepared the reaction solution, which is a little bit involved, we'll talk about that on the next slide, at relatively low temperatures, so room temperature and particularly below as we get down to 10 and five degrees, the solution will appear pink. And we're going to take an absorption spectrum, a visible absorption spectrum of this solution, and that pink color will manifest itself as a relatively large absorbance at 500 nanometers. Now, for reasons that the paper goes into that I won't go into in detail here, I've really exaggerated this difference, and you may not see a larger absorbance at 500 than 690, but in a relative sense, relative to the high temperature situation, this absorbance will be relatively large, and the absorbance at 690, which we'll come to in a second, 690 nanometers, will be much lower. That absorption at 500 nanometers is responsible for the pink color associated with the hexaqua cobalt 2 cation, and this is the dominant species at low temperature. That actually suggests a value for the magnitude of K, and that's, that's worth thinking about whether you'd expect K to be greater than or less than 1 based on this result. As we heat the solution, a dramatic color change takes place, and at high temperature, the solution becomes blue. So when we take that pink solution and we heat it to room temperature and beyond, it takes on a noticeable blue color. This also has a pretty dramatic effect on the absorption spectrum, dramatically enhancing the absorption at 690 nanometers and diminishing the absorption at 500 nanometers. So now our absorbance spectrum will look something like this, with a substantial peak at 690 nanometers and a much smaller, potentially negligible peak at 500 nanometers. The blue color of the solution and the strong absorbance at 690 are both due to this absorption by the product, COCl4 2 minus.
And what this is telling us is that at high temperatures, the product starts to dominate. So the value of K is changing and shifting to a value that favors the product over the reactants. And we can get a quantitative sense of that by measuring the absorbances at 500 and 690 as a function of temperature. We're gonna use these to calculate the equilibrium constants, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. Finally, let's talk about how we're going to measure the equilibrium constant and prepare the reaction mixture. So, as we saw in the measurement of K experiment, the key to measuring an equilibrium constant is just getting some measure of the equilibrium concentrations of all aqueous reactants and products. And to do this in this lab, we're going to make use of the Beer-Lambert law, or Beer's law, as we did previously in that experiment. And so, the product is blue and the reactant is pink. So, we can use Beer's law for both of these species to calculate their concentrations. Now, Beer's law is wavelength dependent. There is a molar absorptivity or epsilon value for each specific wavelength, just as there is a specific absorption for each particular wavelength. So we can write a Beer's law equation for the reactant hexaquo cobalt two plus that involves the absorbance at 500 nanometers and the epsilon value at that specific wavelength. And you can find this value in a table in the paper. There is a separate and distinct, and a, it's a different number, molar absorptivity or epsilon value at 690 nanometers, and this is for the product, COCl4 two minus. And so we can get a measure of that concentration by looking at the specific absorbance value at 690 and dividing that by the epsilon value at 690. And in both of these equations, we're assuming that the y-intercept is zero, and that's good enough for our purposes here. So this will give us measures of the equilibrium concentrations of the product and reactant cobalt complexes. Now what about the chloride? Well, as we saw in the measurement of K experiment previously, we can get the chloride by using an ice table approach. We know how much product was formed. We can use stoichiometry to calculate the total or initial concentration of chloride in the solution. And the equilibrium concentration of chloride is simply the total amount we started with, the initial amount, minus the amount that was incorporated into the cobalt tetrachloro product. So we're going to subtract four times that equilibrium concentration of the product complex since there are four chlorides in each formula unit of the product complex. Now, we might call this, if, if we turn our attention back to the cobalt hexaquo complex, we might call this approach using Beer's Law method A, and this is what the paper calls it. This is one approach to calculating the equilibrium reactant cobalt concentration, but there's another approach. If you think back to the measurement of K experiment, we actually only had an absorbance for the product. The reactant iron was colorless in that experiment, and so we had to use a different approach in that experiment based on an ice approach. And that's the idea behind what the paper calls method B. The reason we're really pursuing method B in this experiment, even though the reactant is colored, is that there is a very large difference between the epsilon values for the reactant and product cobalt complexes. And the epsilon value for the reactant complex in particular is tiny. It's only something like four liters per mole per centimeter, which is not very sensitive at all. This means it's very hard for the spectrometer to detect changes in the concentration of the coh 2 plus complex because even large changes in concentration produce relatively small changes in absorbance measurements. So method B is really based on an ice table approach for that reactant cobalt complex using the same idea that we applied for determining the equilibrium concentration of chloride, saying, okay, I know how much product I have at equilibrium from the absorbance measurement at 690. I can first use stoichiometry to determine the total concentration of cobalt-2 in my system. We'll actually dig into that here a little bit later. And then subtract out the amount of cobalt that was consumed to form the product. The remaining amount must be coh 2 plus the reactant cobalt complex. So this just uses an ice approach to the calculation of the reactant cobalt complex, and it's an alternative to using the Beard-Lambert law. You'll notice a tiny but significant difference and systematic difference between the K values calculated using method A for the reactant cobalt concentration and method B, and we're going to explore that as we work up the data. Now finally, let's talk about preparing the reaction mixture here. So we're going to begin by preparing a solution of cobalt with a little bit of chloride using cobalt chloride, cobalt-2 chloride hexahydrate as our cobalt source. 
about 0.9 grams of it. We're going to dissolve that in 50 milliliters of solution in a volumetric flask. To get additional chloride in there, we're going to take 25 milliliters of that stock cobalt solution and add to it about 25 milliliters of concentrated HCl to generate a total solution volume of 50 milliliters. And we're going to use that total solution volume here in a second. Now this is concentrated hydrochloric acid, you're going to want to be very careful with it, and the molarity of chloride in that solution is very, very high, 12.1 moles per liter of chloride and hydronium ions. One thing to point out here, which we're going to use in a second, is that there are two sources of chloride in this reaction mixture. There's the HCl, and there's the portion of the cobalt chloride that makes it into the final solution, which is actually only half of the solid we added, right, since we took 25 milliliters of that stock 50 ml solution to put into our final solution. So we'll come to that in a second, but let's talk about the total cobalt concentration first. What is the total concentration of cobalt in the final reaction solution? It's not just the 0.9 grams in moles divided by 50 milliliters because we only used half of that stock solution. So what we're going to do is take half of the moles of COCl2.6H2O that we added in the form of this 0.9 grams and divide that by the final total solution volume, which is 50 milliliters. This is our total or initial cobalt 2 plus concentration. And remember, we're going to use this in the ice-based calculation of the reactant cobalt equilibrium concentration. So we're going to use that value up here. So it's important to understand how to calculate it from the stoichiometry of everything we're, we're putting together. The total chloride concentration is needed for that equilibrium concentration of chloride via the ice approach. This total is essentially the initial value on an ice table, you can think about it. And for that, remember, there are two contributions to the chloride concentration. The moles derived from HCl, which is 25 milliliters of 12.1 molar hydrochloric acid, essentially, and the moles derived from the cobalt to chloride hexahydrate, which again, remember, is only half of this mass of cobalt we added since we took that stock solution and only used half of it in the final solution. All those, that, that total number of moles is divided by the final solution volume, which is a total of 50 milliliters, and this Cl minus total concentration, essentially, let's add the TOT suffix on the end of this to show that it is a total concentration of chloride. You can think of as the initial value on the ice table before we've considered any reaction what is the total amount of chloride we've got in there? We're going to subtract out four times our product cobalt concentration at equilibrium to find the equilibrium concentration of chloride. And so these three values will be plugged into the equilibrium equation. Out will pop K. And in essence, we're just going to do this at five or six different temperatures to obtain the temperature dependence of K for this reaction and then infer the standard enthalpy and entropy changes from those measurements. And they'll be different for methods A and B, and it's an interesting difference uh, that you'll notice, with method B being potentially more accurate as a result of problematic errors associated with this tiny molar absorptivity for the reactant cobalt complex.